kids can be dismissed at this time. And then I'm just going to finish my prayer real quick. Father, I thank you for your presence, Lord. Thank you for the work that you did. Thank you that you, Jesus, were obedient to the end. And Lord, I pray that that would touch our hearts. I pray, Lord, that um, I pray, Lord, that that would just affect us in in the biggest way possible, Lord. This life change, Father. I pray that you would speak to our hearts today, Lord. That we wouldn't just listen with our mind, but I pray that we would open our hearts and that you would speak to us. Lord, bless bless this day. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. We love you so much. Welcome, everyone. How you doing on this long weekend? Come on, long weekend. That's a, that's a good thing unless you got to work it. I'm working this weekend. <laughs> Glad that you're here today. We're so excited and thankful whether you're in person or online or whether you're tuning in on our Sea Road podcast later throughout the week because that's what you need to do to stay connected here to our family. We're glad and thankful to be invited into this adventure and this journey alongside of you in this season. We're working our way through the book of Philippians. Book of Philippians is chocked full of just really good, intimate stuff that can inspire us and challenge us and remind us of a whole bunch of different things, and we're glad that you are on this adventure with us. This is week three, and it's going to carry us through all the way up until and including Father's Day, so it's going to be awesome. But before I get started, I want to do just do something a little bit different. I am coming into this morning a little frazzled, okay? I'm coming into this morning a little frazzled. My wife is in Alberta right now, and so I'm solo parenting, and I'm losing, Okay? I'm losing, I'm losing, and so I want to pray for you, I want to pray for me, and I don't know if that resonates with you. Maybe you're coming into today a little frazzled, and you're undone, or you feel untethered in some way. I want to pray for you, because I think God has something specific for us here today and this morning, and and what I want to do is get out of the way and let him speak to our hearts and our minds. So would you join me as we just pause and pray? Father, in these next few moments, we are here, we are here to hear from you. And so God, I pray that you would allow us the privilege of being immersed in your presence, individually and collectively. Father, I pray for open hearts, I pray for open minds, I pray for open ears. Father, I pray that you would allow me to get out of the way and allow you to take stage so that your truth can inspire and convict and encourage wherever it is needed to hear here today. For Father, I I pray for all the, the cluttered minds out there, the cluttered hearts, that they would just be at rest in these next few moments so that we can hear clearly from you. We pray this in your name. Amen. We're going to be talking about kingdom DNA today, and I'm kind of fascinated with DNA. I never wanted to be a scientist or a biochemist or anything like that because that involved way more school than I was comfortable committing to. And so DNA is one of those things that kind of tells a little bit about your story. One of the coolest things for us when we moved out here to Ontario, despite it being a pandemic when we came and arrived in this space, is that there was a history and a legacy for the Frizzell family in this area and in this region. My dad grew up here in Ontario. And so coming back to Ontario, not knowing a lot about the Frizzell side, I was in, in, 
inspired and intrigued about the possibility of learning more. And so I want to play a little bit of a game here today with you all. And online, you can play this as well. I want you to, to yell out at me where you think my last name comes from, the origin story. So I'm looking for a specific piece of heritage. My last name is Frizzell, two Zs, two Ls. It's a double-double, okay? You'll never forget how to spell it. Where do you think it comes from? Du somebody said Dutch? Okay, no. Italian, Italian. okay. German? What else? Irish. Irish. Who said Irish? Stand up if you said it. All right, give that man a hand. He is correct. Now, I never knew this growing up, and in grade four out west, you have to do these projects tracing your family tree and your lineage and history. And I got a little bit, a little bit stuck when it came to the Frizzell side because we didn't have a lot of information on where we came from. So I was able to, you know, use a little tool called Ancestry.ca, do some research, and discover that the very first Frizzell that came to Canada was in 1845, and they just so happened to land in Kingston. In fact, just north of Kingston on your way to Roblin, there is a road that's named after me. So if you're ever on that road, please take that sign down. I need it for my office. It's interesting to me how fascinated we can be for, about where we're from and why it matters. And I'll tell you this, when I'm solo parenting, I'm thinking about all the ways that the DNA that is being exhibited in front of me relates to my wife and not to me, okay? I'm thinking about, oh my goodness, that behavior is definitely from her side of the family. It's a lot easier when she's not in the same room to counteract that thought. DNA, it's one of those things that we think about subversively, subconsciously, and sometimes intentionally. You get a young married couple, and I've had the privilege of walking through some pre-marriage coaching with several couples here in our church. Do you know that there's like nine couples in our church getting married over this next year? Like it's, it's crazy. And in a couple years, that nursery is going to be bumping, man. It's going to be amazing. And one of the things that young couples are, are preoccupied by, their thoughts and their ideas, is if we have children, I wonder what they're going to look like. I wonder what DNA is going to shape who they are. And the same thing goes with our spiritual lives as well. We exist in this reality where we have laden kingdom DNA. What I mean is dormant kingdom DNA inside each one of us. And sometimes we just need to be reminded about what it is so that we can exhibit it, demonstrate it, and also press into it a little bit more intentionally. And I think that's what some of what Paul is, is talking about when he's digging into the second chapter in Philippians. And so I want to invite you to turn with me to right to the beginning of this chapter 2. We're going to look at the first 11 verses of this text, and we're going to uncover four pieces of kingdom DNA that he invites followers of Jesus to embrace, to apply into their own lives, and to exhibit it to the best of their ability through whatever circumstances they might be facing and situations. It's going to be fun for us to discover this and learn this with one another. And again, if you've got your mobile device and you do prefer using digital means, you can go onto the YouVersion Bible app Follow along on the Sea Road Live application there, the, the event, and, and uh, join us in that capacity as well. And one more side note, if you don't have a Bible, come see me. Come see one of my team. We want to gift you a Bible, the Word of God, something that will bring you comfort and joy and, su and sustenance when you need it. Starting in verse 1 of the second chapter. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out for only your own interests. But take an interest in others, too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had, 
Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. There's this potent reality that Paul begins to articulate and illustrate for this first group of people that would have read and listened to these, these words of this letter. And, and I believe they're really deeply impactful and can be for you and I today. As I mentioned, there's four pieces of this kingdom DNA that we're going to look at that these verses highlight. We're going to start with number one, which is love. What better place than to start with love? Now, love is confusing, love is weird, love is awkward, love is inspiring, love is something that we can be tethered by, bound by, inspired by, encouraged by, confused by, all in the same moment. Love, let's easily define what we're talking about and what I believe Paul is wanting us to understand from these section of verses about love. Love is fighting for the best in somebody else. Love is fighting for the best in somebody else. There's all sorts of depictions of what our world and our culture and our society will tell us that love is. Love is about a physical, intimate pursuit. That's a, an expression of love, but that's not the only piece of love. Love is when you buy a ring and put it on somebody's finger and do the Beyonce thing. You like it, you put a ring on it. That's not just love. Love is fighting for the best in somebody else. Now, here's what that means and translates to in, in real practical ways in the Frizzell household. I don't know if you've ever encountered this, whether you yourself would have exhibited this. I doubt it. Or you as a parent have witnessed this thing called attitude. Have you ever bumped up against that A word before? It just surfaces out of nowhere, right? It just bubbles up and you're like, ooh, there it is. And sometimes it actually bubbles up in you as a parent. Right? And you're in the middle of a conversation, and you're like, oh, I'm the one that's exhibiting attitude. Interesting. But you never let on that it's you, because in that moment, you're the parent. Fighting for the best in another person is seeing that person's potential and being committed to unearthing it. Seeing somebody's potential and being committed to unearthing it. I can't help but think that's exactly the posture that Jesus took when he, look, when he looked at the people around him in real time when he had his human experience and the posture that he takes right now when he looks at you and me. He looks at us and he says, there's some latent, dormant kingdom DNA potential and I'm so passionate and excited about it that I am going to fight for what is best in your life and what is best in my life. I think it's what motivated him to do what he did, which is die an absolutely deplorable death, one where he's ridiculed and shamed and abandoned and betrayed, abused, mistreated, misunderstood. All of that stuff because of love. Because what he saw in you and I, and he saw something worth fighting for. Our very well-being our kingdom purpose, our presence, despite our past, fighting for our future. Now, in our world today, we're going to look at different examples of love and see the absence of a lot of that activity. We see that love is sometimes about being self-seeking. Well, I love what I do, therefore I'm going to squash everything and everyone around me so that I can achieve my success, my design, my hope, my purpose. Well, I love this, and therefore if I love it, I'm going to transfer that love onto somebody else, even though they may not love or appreciate my same passion, my same desire. One of my greatest failures as a dad is that my oldest son cheers for the Pittsburgh Penguins. 
I know, I failed. Now he's laughing because he's like, my team wins, your team loses. I failed because I didn't transfer my passion, my love, my lament of being a Leafs fan onto my son. So I'm fighting for the best inside of him and saying, well, like, here's the possibilities. The underdog needs people to cheer for them as well. Sometimes when we love, it hurts. Sometimes when we love, we have to give people the freedom to do things that we ourselves would choose not to do. And sometimes love means letting somebody suffer the consequences of a decision that they've made, even when you know it's going to bring great pain. See, when God looks at you and I, God is love. It's his character. It's who he is. It is his DNA. He can't operate outside of love. And when he looks at us, he gives us the freedom to choose whether or not we are going to follow after him. In every moment of every day, he gives us the freedom of choice. All the while fighting for what is best for us. Even when we reject what is best. The kingdom DNA that's that's dormant inside us sometimes is love. Jesus said it best when he was talking to a a cluster of his closest friends. He said, the world will know that you love me by the way you love one another. We're going to be known by the way that we love one another. And if we're quite honest, there are times where we are known more for our hatred than we are for our love. We've become single issue pursuits, pursuers of something. Whether it's abortion, politics, the way we spend our money, same-sex marriage, and we come, and in those moments where we're pursuing those things, we're exhibiting something else outside of love. And I wonder if Paul is just kind of reminding this Philippian church and reminding us here today that there are going to be moments in time where we're going to have a decision that we need to make. What are we going to be known for? Are we going to be known for love, somebody who's willing to fight for the best in another person, or somebody who has an agenda that they're trying to move forward? Love is kind and patient. Love is caring. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. And to have that mindset and that posture, that's what it means to love. And that's what it means to allow kingdom DNA to grow inside us and to work through us. That's not the only thing that Paul is talking about. Love is where the conversation begins, this expectancy that the the body of Christ, the family of God, is going to be known for the way that they love one another. And then he starts talking about the second one. He starts talking about humility. Now, humility is an interesting word. Humility, when you boil it down, means learning to think of ourselves less. Not to think less of ourselves, but to think of ourselves less. Meaning the volume of our thoughts are less about our individual self and more about people around us. That doesn't mean we reject our ideas, our needs, our desires, our own hopes and dreams, or anything like that. But it means that we put it in its proper place. Then Paul goes on to write about Jesus from the expression of humility. He said, listen, you've got this, you've got this trinity God, this community nature God who sends his son into the world, who is fully divine and yet puts his divinity basically to the side and is willing to accept a human-initiated experience so that He can show us and demonstrate that life can be lived according to kingdom DNA principles moving forward. It's possible. It's possible to do it alongside of God, empowered by his strength and his hope and his well-being and all the things that we need to find success. Because success is actually just obedience to what God invites us into. Nothing more and nothing less. And that's a completely countercultural idea. Because in our world today, we're in, inspired and told and, and really almost coerced 
to pursue our individual expression of whatever it might be. And what's true is we matter as an individual. Absolutely. 100% we matter. God died. God sent his son, Jesus, to die for you and for me on an individual basis, but also communally. And so humility is putting ourselves in the right pecking order, subject to God's design, subject to his hopes and his dreams for our own lives and for our world in general. And so we're invited to marry this whole pursuit of love with this idea of humility, of learning to think of ourselves less. And that's super frustrating because in our culture today, I actually think we value narcissism over humility. I think narcissism is a spectrum. I think we're, we're, we're forced, we're inspired, we're encouraged to think of ourselves in so many different ways. What's the definition of a narcissist? Somebody who can't think of anybody but themselves. That's the definition. And so when we're culturally told to make sure that we've got our stuff all together, make sure that we need, we, we have our own personal needs met, which are good and healthy things, but it becomes out of balance when that becomes our only focus. And the crazy thing is this, it's really difficult to love a narcissist because nothing is ever good enough. Nothing. It's always about them. Like, if I was trying to do, like, a life stage and des describe what a narcissist is, I, I would pick the, the toddler stage of human beings, right? Like, ages one to three. It's all about them, right? They wake up in the middle of the night. They're hungry. Like, feed me now. They don't care that you were sleeping. But we think we're, they're cute, and so we meet their needs. We feed into that, and soon enough, they become a 40-year-old, and they never leave our house. See, the thing with kingdom DNA is what we feed grows. What we feed grows. If we're feeding pride, that's going to grow inside of us. It's okay to be confident in your own accomplishments or in somebody else's accomplishments. But we need to put them in the right place. Subject to God's design. Subject to his vision for your life and for the world around us. We need to marry humility with love. We need to learn to think of ourselves less so that we're open to the possibility of being inconvenienced or what we think is inconvenienced by others. And then we could follow Jesus into the lives of people and demonstrate that God is alive and active by the way we love. But we can't do that if we're always thinking about ourselves. Self-preservation. Worried that if we don't get our own needs met, nobody else is going to meet them. Man, just bring your needs to Jesus. If you've got a financial need, bring that to Jesus. If you've got a, a health need, bring it to Jesus. If you've got this deep wound that needs healing, bring it to Jesus. If Jesus can't heal it, then, then let me say this. Then, then he is not the God that we need. But Jesus can heal it. That's the truth. Some of us have just believed the lie that he isn't big enough to handle our own stuff. Or that he doesn't care about this one thing because it's too small. Why would we inconvenience him with it? Humility is learning to think of ourselves less along the way. Love and humility. There's a third kingdom DNA principle that's kind of unearthed by these 11 verses, and that's forgiveness. Now, forgiveness is a loaded word. Forgiveness is a loaded word because it is so confusing. Right? When forgiveness from God's perspective. When we, if we do a 1 John 1, 9 type reality, when we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When God extends forgiveness to us, he says, Jason, yes, I know you're a screw-up. I saw what happened the other day. Thank you for identifying that. He's already aware of our shortcomings and our undoings. 
Yes, I'm going to extend forgiveness to you, and I'm not going to hold it against you. That's the God's perspective, forgiveness. But then there's this human expression of forgiveness, and it gets a little bit muddy in those waters. See, if we defined forgiveness as simply the ability to build a bridge, the ability to build a bridge, because it's hard when somebody has hurt us, it is hard to forget that pain and that hurt. And I'm going to say we, we probably don't even have to forget it. We need to heal from it. We need to learn from it. But we don't have to forget it. If we've been abused in some way, shape, or form, I am so sorry if that is your story, if that is the pain and the wound that you harbor. Forgiveness does not mean staying in that situation so that it can happen to you again and again and again. But forgiveness will mean that you build a bridge of restoration and reconciliation to whatever degree that looks like. Let me share an example of my young son, Paxton, to illustrate this. It's the best one that I've got. It involves a toilet. When we were living in Red Deer, my son, Paxton, who's as cute as a button, decided, and he knows it, that's the problem, decided that it would be fun to create a waterfall experience for some of his Paw Patrol toys. And so he started flushing them one by one down the toilet. Now it was a Saturday. It was my day off, and I had so many other things planned to do that day. I was going to lounge around in my sweatpants and do nothing. I was going to eat whatever I wanted. I was going to speak only when spoken to. It was going to be glorious. And all of a sudden, one of my other kids let me know that the bathroom toilet isn't working anymore. Something's down there. And Paxton said, yeah, my toys, I flushed them. (laughs) Marshall, Marshall. So there's this video that Bonnie took of me having to deconstruct our main floor bathroom. With all the intricacies that that includes... And Paxton comes around the toilet, and he says, Dad, I flushed it. I say, yes, buddy, you did. Should you ever do that again? Yeah, it was fun. No. (laughs) No. No, you should never do that again. And why I love that we got this captured on video is because I know that Bonnie is recording it, but in the moment that I'm interacting with my son, I am angry. I'm angry, and I'm trying to trying my best to not lose my temper and lose my mind as this little guy is telling me about his wonderful adventure of flushing his toys. We don't ever do that again. That's the phrase. We never do this again. But if you look at my eyes, there's intensity. There's rage. There's frustration. There's all these emotions that are pent up. I share that story with you for several reasons. Number one, Don't flush your toys, okay? It's not worth it. Number two, there will be a visceral emotional response with forgiveness. It's okay to be angry and still say sorry. It's okay to be angry and try and build a bridge. It's okay to feel betrayed and alone and frustrated And still pursue forgiveness. Forgiveness does not mean that you need to forget your experience. I will never forget the deconstruction of that day. And when he gets married one day, Lord willing, I'm telling that story. Every chance I get. It doesn't mean you have to forget. But here's what happens. Unconfessed pain creates a tearing or a schism inside of us, right in the fabric DNA of our souls. A literal schism and tear. And it's not the kind of thing that we could go to and uh, as tourists marvel at, like the Grand Canyon, where there's a tearing of, of land from one spot to the other spot. And we're like, ooh, look, it's grand. It's a canyon. Yay, let's make some money. We can't do that with our own souls. When there's unconfessed pain 
and unforgiveness that bubbles up, it becomes bitterness and then it creates chaos wherever it goes. Because out of the condition of our heart, our mouth speaks. I've said some awful things throughout my 41 years of life. It's because there was something inside of me that I hadn't yet dealt with. It was creating chaos and havoc all around me. I'm convinced more than ever that if we're going to be known for our love and pursue humility, that forgiveness walks hand in hand with those two things. And learning to forgive is probably one of the more challenging things that you and I will ever have to navigate on this side of eternity. And that's where we look to Jesus, who is hanging on the cross, fully exposed, literally bleeding out. And he looks at the people that have been involved in that process, and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So next time we bump up against a bully, We can ask for forgiveness. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now you might be thinking, but Jason, what if they do know what they're doing? Then what? Father, forgive them for being an idiot. Forgiveness is all about building a bridge. That's what we can control, is whether or not the bridge gets built for the health and the well-being of your own soul, my encouragement to you is to start building that bridge, even though it's painful. You don't have to reject all of the emotional responses that you are feeling along the way. And that bridge might take years or decades to build. Don't give up. Allow that kingdom DNA to grow something inside of you that you perhaps thought was nearly impossible. There's love, there's humility, there's forgiveness. And then a fourth one that I want to talk about is passion. Passion. Now, passion is one of those things that it, we, we speak about a lot, right? You got these kids that are graduating from high school, and sometimes one of the conversations that we have or questions that we ask them is like, what's your passion? What do you want to do with the rest of your life? And many of them just glaze over, and they're like, I... I don't know, like I'm worried about the next 15 minutes, not, not the next 15 years. Or some of them might articulate that their passion is to create a wonderful, you know, bachelor-type suite in their parents' basement. And then you can course correct that passion. Passion is, is one of those things that I believe that God gives each one of us. Things that matter to us. Things that we care about things that we're invested in. My wife is passionate about people. She is one of the best individuals that I know in terms of caring for others. She's also one of the worst texters that I know. Like, she doesn't get back to people. You text her and you're like, like are, are, are you alive? <laughs> are, are you responding? But when you're in her presence, you feel like there's nobody else in the world. I, on the other hand, am opposite. I'll get back to your text messages, but when you're in my presence, you might be like, is this meeting over yet? I have to go detox. Passion is one of those things that we're naturally gifted in or naturally pursue or we have a desire to see and unfold, and those are amazing things. But there's a fine line between passion and chaos. See, sometimes what happens in our passion is that we do or we say things that actually inflict or raise up more conflict than they they need to. Right? Like, you've heard me share from stage about my affinity towards the Leafs, and some of you do not agree with me, and that's okay. If we were to have a passionate conversation about the well-being of hockey in Canada, we might get into some really heated conversations. And it's okay if you disagree with me, even though you're wrong. (laughs) 
See, passion can invoke all of these sorts of different ideas. And in fact, what's happened in God's family in general from a global perspective is passion has created division. It hasn't created unity. Because we're so passionate about this one thing that instead of building bridges of connection with other people, we've created an island of isolation. Oh, well, we're the only ones that have figured this out. Therefore, we are right and everybody else is wrong. Passion can actually blind us to what is true. Now, that's what happens when passion is on steroids and it goes unchecked and it's not balanced. This is why, again, we speak about the, the vitality and the necessity of community. Because when you have an individual that's passionate in a community, in a collection of people, that community can hold that individual accountable in terms of their passion. Some of the things that you and I care about aren't major things. They're not something that everybody in the world needs to be caring about at the same level. Maybe they need to be aware of, but maybe they don't need to carry the weight of that passion to the degree that we do. It's like parenting. There are a whole bunch of different ways to parent. Some are really good, some are really terrible. Some people that you meet are really passionate about their expression of parenting. Like homeschooling, or private school, or public school, or separate school. Talk, talk to a family that has made a passionate decision on their to choice of education for their children, and you're going to bubble up all sorts of interesting conversations along the way. Passion unchecked leads to chaos. Creating conflict, and disconnect. All you have to do is, for fun, go and listen to some viral American preachers, and they'll talk from the stage that if you're a Christian, you can only vote one way. That's not biblical. But their passion causes them to do or say things that just aren't true. See, there's a delicate line between passion and preference. And we've got to be okay with this kingdom DNA that we've been given to not allow it to be something that informs what we prefer. Because usually in our preferences, the only one that benefits is us. So I'm convinced more than ever from this section of Philippians that if we were to pursue love and humility and forgiveness and passion in tandem with one another, we would be able to step into some of what God's heart and design is for our world right now, here today, and moving forward. But the challenge is sometimes we, we don't necessarily want to have that look in the mirror type moment. And so what I'm going to encourage you and me to do over this next week is something that might make us a tad bit uncomfortable, but that's okay. Awkward doesn't kill you. I'm going to suggest that there are four questions that we can ask God in our quiet time with him and some trusted friends in our community. And if you are so ever daring and are a parent or grandparent, you can ask your children or grandchildren these questions. One by one, we're going to walk through them. Sebastian's going to put the first one up here on the screen. Have you ever seen in me, have you ever seen love in me? If so, when or how? So I literally want you to do this, whether it's in your quiet time with God or it's the phone a friend reality on who wants to be a millionaire. Call up that person and I want you to ask them this question. Have you ever seen love in me? If so, when? If they say no, that's a great place to start. Sometimes we don't know and we can't see what we don't see and what we don't know. So we need other people around us to remind us. 
Now, you're going to want to, Jason, what kind of a friend should I call? How about somebody that you're not in conflict with right now, okay? Because these answers change. These answers change if there's unresolved conflict or tension between you and that person. But if you're comfortable, or even if you're not, I encourage you in your quiet time with God and with your friend, this phone call, to start with this question. It is a really interesting journey from this moment on. A whole bunch of stuff might bubble up. Why are you asking me this? Well, this crazy guy that I go and listen to on Sundays told me that I needed to and I want to check off the box of the thing that I'm supposed to do, so that's why I did it. Hopefully that's not your motivation. Hopefully your motivation is like, I want to know if I'm a loving person. So I'm asking those around me if they see that in me. Is that DNA present? Here's a second question. You might want to screenshot these. Do we have an honest friendship or one that is built on appearances and trying to one-up each other? This is a question about humility. Do we have an honest friendship or are we just in relationship with each other because we like to one-up one another? Right? Oh, you got a boat? I got a bigger boat. Oh, you caught a fish? I caught a whole school of fish. What's your relationship built on? You're going to be able to unearth that. Competition can be healthy, but it can also be a detriment to the vitality of relationships around you. In your marriage, if you happen to be married, if you've got too much competition between husband and wife, you are not growing together. You're growing apart. It's not about one-upping one another. It's about learning to think about other people in addition to yourself, and sometimes ahead of yourself. So asking this question could be great. Asking it to Jesus might be sobering as well. Hey, Jesus, do we just hang out because you give me stuff? Is that, is that what you feel like? Like, I'm, I'm only praying to you because I'm in chaos right now, or I need something, or I want something? Question number three, this has to deal with, uh, can you put that next one up there, Sebastian? Thank you, buddy. Is there anything I've done or said to you that has hurt you that I haven't asked forgiveness for? The reality is if you're in a relationship of any kind, a friendship, a neighbor relationship, parent, child, grandchild, grandparent, you're going to wound somebody. We're broken people, broken people break other people. It's what we do. That's not a license for us to keep doing it, but that's just a reality check. So those hard conversations that need to happen sometimes in our closest relationships, a question like this can be helpful. Because sometimes it's hard to bring up the pain that we feel from people that are closest to us. And this is a sobering question when you ask Jesus the very same thing. Because remember, he bore the weight of all sin for all time on the cross. That means you and I have contributed to the pain that he felt that day. You and I have contributed. And so to, to ask him this question and then to, to apologize when maybe he has felt betrayed or abandoned by us in a circumstance or a situation... And then that friend, this is a bridge-building conversation. You ask somebody, you ask a neighbor, you ask your, your children. It gives you the opportunity to, to speak into a wound that you have been an active participant in creating. And your willingness to participate in, in restoration will speak volumes to your friend and to your child and to your own ability to pursue healthy relationships moving forward. Fourth question is this. When you've heard me share about my passion, do I share in such a way as to inspire people around me? Or does my passion create unnecessary conflict and pain? When I think about this question, I think about the, the mob of people that rallied 
around Jesus' mock trial. There were people that were stirring up the crowd around them so that they were making a decision that they didn't even know had implications that they were aware of, right? Crucify him, crucify him. Who? Who are we crucifying? What's happening right now? Sometimes in our passion, we are blind to the chaos that we are unintentionally creating around us. And so asking this question of those trusted friendships that you have around you might give you a little bit of insight on where you need to dial it down. This is one that I ask Bonnie a lot. Because this is one that I am unaware of at times. I unintentionally diminish people around me, including my children at times. Because I'm so excited and I'm so passionate about being right. Like the way I load the dishwasher, it is the only way to load it. It's the best, most efficient. And sometimes I just can't see what I can't see. Until I have a loving friend around me who reminds me that there's more than what I can see in my limited vision. In my limits of passion. You don't think God loves everybody in the world? Man, he loves people more deeply, more completely, more wholly than you and I ever could. But he invites us, why I don't know. He invites us into the adventure of loving people just the way, like, just the way he does along our life's journey. And that's just simply amazing. So sometimes it's a course correction in my walk with Jesus and going like, okay, where have I allowed my passion to overshadow your presence? And in those moments, you can ask for forgiveness and step back and build bridges and create new ways forward for everybody. And I recognize this is hard stuff. Look, following Jesus is not easy. It is not for the faint of heart. But if you have tried everything else and it's only led to chaos and disaster, I'm telling you, this is the way forward that you've been waiting for. You might not believe me because you're like, man, that's a lot of heavy stuff you just talked about. I'm not sure that I want to go there. When we have no other options and everything else has been exhausted, I'm telling you, it is the best way forward for your life. And so I'm going to go to a time of prayer, and if you don't yet know Jesus, I'm going to pray specifically for you. If you know Jesus and one of these things has landed with you and you need to walk forward with Jesus in, into this week carrying it and, and, and diagnosing it and maybe actually pursuing it, I'm going to be praying for you. And together, I hope and I pray and I dream that we can reflect the nature of Christ more and more and more each day so that more people who do not yet know Jesus will encounter a loving, breathing, life-giving God through their interactions with people who say that they love him. That is our plan and that is our purpose here in life. What a privilege to participate in that. Would you join me in prayer? And if you feel comfortable, just open up your hands and place them on your lap. I'll pray for you. I'll pray for me. Jesus, there's so many times where I've fallen short of this kingdom DNA. I've walked away from it. I've forgotten that it's there. I've misused it. And for all of those things and all of those ways, I ask for forgiveness. And Jesus, I believe that there are people here that can identify with that reality, that tension also. And so I ask for forgiveness for them. And God, there might be somebody here today or online or listening to the podcast that's like, I don't yet know Jesus. And I'm really curious. I don't want to start following. I pray, God, that you give them the words to articulate the formation of a relationship with you moving forward. God, I pray for the wounds that are in this space that we carry inside of us, some that have become scars, some that have defined us way too much, some that we're just unearthing for the very first time. Father, we need you to work a miracle in us and through us and around us. Not for our own sake, not just so we can champion forward being healed and restored and, 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 and fully complete, although that is great, but we also want to be a conduit for that, for your presence into all the spaces of our lives. 
We want to be the best parents that you've called us to be, the best grandparents, the best neighbors, the best co-workers, the best laborers, the best soulmates, the best friends, the best leaders that you've created us to be. That's our hope, that's our desire, and without you, we will never get there. So, Father, would you fill us anew with your presence? We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
God is good and all the time. Awesome. Before we get going today, I just want to remind you guys, uh, My Summer Rocks registration opens next week, uh, May 29th, and uh, we're super excited to get the registration open, get the kids registered to learn about Jesus and have some fun this summer. Uh, also, along with the move of Chuck and Gemma coming over here with their family, with their, with their two girls, uh, there's a whole host of things that go along with that, I, as I'm sure we can all imagine moving across the ocean. And so we're just asking for a prayer for the Egbenike family over the next couple of weeks. Would you be in prayer uh, for them, for their girls, for that transition, that everything would go smoothly, and for their two-week quarantine when they get here as well? And also, if you want to partner with the, the ministries of Centennial Row with what God's doing here and now in our community, you can do so financially. There's a Dropbox in the back, debit machine in the boulevard. You can give online as well. And if you want your giving to go specifically to the Ukraine relief, just make sure it is uh, identified as such, and we'll make sure that gets there. I'm just going to read a benediction over you before we go today from Philippians. I pray that your love will overflow more and more, and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. Go with Jesus today. We love you, and we'll see you guys next week.